happen? Um, Based on a book that I did a few years ago with Kevin Kryzak, but I've gone and updated all the statistics and my hypotheses and theories and thoughts. So it's a new idea. And we started the book with this question of what happened to traffic. And if you think about the history of transport, a major seminal moment, certainly for the United States, um, occurred with the beginning of the interstate highway program. Now, this followed on autobahns in Germany and autostrada in, in, in Italy and was followed by freeway systems in other countries. But this was you know, the first large national system of, of freeways. Um, and this occurred in, in 1956. And I imagine, well, what would happen, what does the world look like in 2056? So ask the question, remember traffic. And so we have, for a long time in the transport community, have thought about traffic as being something that's an ever-increasing phenomenon. And it doesn't have to be, and it might not be. And we have always thought about the primary travel um, event being going to work. And as we've learned in the last two years, going to work is not something that everyone has to do in terms of physically traveling from your home to your workplace. Many people are able to work remotely, at least some of the time. And many of us are now remote. I'm giving this presentation remotely. And most of you, I imagine, are watching it not on the University of Sydney campus. We had office buildings. Will we continue to have office buildings? We had long-term careers 100 years before 2056. People would work for the same organization their entire life. They would go to stores on a regular basis. Um, by, 20, by 1956, probably many people had refrigerator, refrigerators in their homes, so they wouldn't have to go shopping daily, but they would go, to shop, go shopping several times a week. We're now at the point where stores come to us. Advertising, long distance trucking, owning a vehicle, sport utility vehicles, driving in downtowns of central business districts, stopping at traffic lights, filling up at gas stations, waiting for buses, seeing highways, parking your car yourself, or driving on roads and not having to pay for them. So these are all things that we've assumed as fixities in the transport field and aren't really fixed. So if we look historically, we can go back, we, we think of sort of the dawn of the auto age with the, the dawn of mass production and Henry Ford and his Model T. And that began in 1905, certainly wasn't the first automobile. The first automobiles date from the late 1700s and there were automobiles running the streets of London in the mid 1800s that they never really took off because they were too expensive, they were too large, they were too bulky, they were hard to control. But in the United States, and this is US data, vehicle kilometers of travel per capita, the blue line here, um, increased steadily through most of the 20th century. You see downward blip during World War II, and in fact, increased until about 2003 or 2004, and then stopped rising. And it dipped, and it stopped rising. This is before the Great Recession, okay? It obviously fell during the Great Recession. Um, started coming back up, but didn't quite reach the pre-recession, pre-Great Recession levels. And then, of course, with COVID, has fallen off a cliff again. And it, this is following a pattern that we've seen before. This is public, public transport passenger journeys per capita. Um, the definitions change a little bit over time, but you can see that those reached a peak really in the 1920s, fell during the Great Depression, spiked upwards during World War II as a sort of as a response to the inability to use automobiles because of fuel rationing and tire rationing. Um, and then again, fell down completely um, through the late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and has sort of leveled off since then until COVID in 2020. And you can look at the very tail of the curve and you can see a, a drop off in 2020 that's much, much sharper than the drop off in, in the automobile. Now you can look at other big trends, roadways per capita, that's fallen. Um, that's because we've added people faster than we've added um, roads. You know, we've uh, urbanized and a lot of the roads were necessary for rural areas, um, but we haven't really added nearly as many in, co in contrast to the population. Um, registered motor vehicles, you know, the, the idea of owning your own car is sort of central to the psyche of Americans. 
We can look at registered motor vehicles per capita. And those have peaked um, similarly in terms of registered motor vehicles, they sort of leveled off in the early 2000s after the financial crisis came up a little bit and have fallen a little bit in the last few years. Um, but per capita, they peaked around the same time as, as driving did around 2003. Total time spent traveling. Okay, again, this is something we, we think about this as being relentless. And this is data from 2003 to 2013 from the American Time Use Survey. We could look at different activities that people engage in, traveling for personal care and going out to eat and doing other household activities, buying goods and services, helping other people, going to work, going to school, engaging in other types of activities and sport. And we can see it dropped in 2003 from about 73 minutes to 67 minutes in 2013. It doesn't sound like a lot, it's six minutes, but it's a drop of 10% in 10 years, okay? If that trend were to continue, which of course it won't continue, but if it were to continue, there wouldn't be any more travel in a century. Um, we can look at this, what's, what are the causes behind this? We can look at how travel has varied by age, co by age cohort um, in year of birth. And we can see that this was a trend um, of, how people are traveling at different ages from, in this case, surveys that were taken at different points in time, when you were born and so on, on the y-axis is number of person trips per day. And if you were born before 1924, you're pretty old, so you're not taking that many trips. Um, if you were, um, and you weren't taking, you were taking more trips when you were a little bit younger. So comparing the 2011 survey with the 2001 survey and comparing that to the 91 survey, you were younger still, so you were taking more trips. You sort of see this life cycle pattern here. But then we look at the younger generations, 1974 to 83, or people born between 1984 and 1993. And at the same age, they're traveling less. Okay. And so that's sort of the key point here is that younger people are traveling less than older people did when they were the same age. We can look at the same pattern for trip distance. And we see the same kind of phenomenon. People are traveling shorter distances. They're making fewer trips and they're traveling shorter distances. So what's going on? When we think about forecasting, we shouldn't be thinking about sort of relentless growth. We should be thinking instead about a life cycle process. And the logistic curve, the blue line here is sort of an approximation of an S curve or logistic curve. And systems tend to follow particular patterns over the life cycle. There's a period of birthing where we have to sort of come up with the idea, work out how it might fit with the market. We get it right, we deploy it spatially, and that takes some number of years depending on the technology. And then it reaches maturation and there's only so much of it we can do. And so the growth slows down and then may eventually start to fall. Now, how does this relate to how we think about the world? If we think about the world, we're doing forecasts. And when we're doing forecasts, we should be thinking about this blue line, but normally what people are doing is looking back a few years and extrapolating forward. So if you are in the early years of a growth trend and you are looking back and saying, well, what was the growth between last year and this year? And then we do a linear extrapolation of it going forward, you get in the early years, you get the green line. But in fact, the blue line is a better approximation of what actually happened. Okay, so those of, everyone in this room has probably had calculus you understand the idea of taking the slope of a curve. Well, in the later years, when growth is slowing, if you're looking backwards, you're gonna overestimate growth. You're gonna predict growth is gonna be following the orange line when it in fact follows the red line. And this kind of graph shows up again and again. And this is data from the United States Department of Transportation projecting future traffic levels. And every year they would extrapolate from the past and predict future traffic levels. Every year the traffic wouldn't grow as much as they predicted, so they would update their forecast. And in the end, they're always forecasting growth and we haven't had growth in the last 10 years. And of course, you know, this is even prior to COVID. We haven't had growth at this point in the last 18 years in a significant way. But the forecasters are always projecting growth. And it's an important distinction and you see that if we don't build this thing, some disastrous transport outcome will occur, but that's not what really happens. So first point is traffic hasn't been growing as fast as we think. Next point is less traffic is a good thing. Um, 
there are a number of reasons for this. Cars kill lots of people. They kill about 1.3 million people globally per year. Okay, that's a big deal. Um, cars pollute. Uh, car pollution probably kills a similar number of people annually, if not more. Um, noise is annoying. Um, noise is annoying and that's bad, but noise is annoying in a way that leads to not only lowered property values, but a study just came out the other day, shows it's a leading cause of Alzheimer's. That if you're subjected to loud highway noises, you're more likely to um, lose some of your mental faculties as you age. And of course, cars consume, or cars more precisely, roads consume lots of space. Um, the paved area of the United States is basically equivalent to that red, that red area there, which is the state of Virginia. That's a, a large territory that we've paved and given over to the automobile. And finally, cars isolate. So the more people who are in cars, the harder it is for the people who aren't in cars. So if you drive, good on you, right? You go, you can easily go from point A to point B, but by you're going from point A to point B, you're easily able to go a longer distance. If you don't have a car, the longer distances between places becomes harder and harder for you. So there are fewer people using public transport, so there's less public transport service. The distances traversed between places get longer and longer, which is harder to do in any mode but an automobile. And of course, cars keep people separated. So if you're in a larger house farther away from other people, then you're going to be less socially integrated. And so we have this problem of social isolation. Now, it depends on your point of view, social isolation, and social distancing is exactly what the government has been telling us to do for the last year and a half to prevent the spread of viruses. But it also is gonna have lots of consequences on people's mental health when the only people that they engage with are themselves or the people in their own household rather than people who are outside of their household. So what are the causes for this? Okay, so, um, there's a famous mystery book um, by Agatha Christie, Murder on the Orient Express, which um, if you're interested in re reading or watching the many movies that have been made on it, um, I'm gonna give you spoilers. And the question was who did it? And the answer is everybody did it. So we have changing demographics. And if you look at the demographic mix, the number of people who are in their peak driving years is uh, changing. Um, this is the US, Australia is going to be similar, a little bit younger, but not much younger. Um, over years, the amount of hours that people work changes. Um, so looking over the long, long term, from 1870, people who were working were on average working about 3000 hours a year, um, a little bit less in Australia, a little bit more in the United States. Um, over time, this number has fallen steadily. Australia was in the lead um, for a while in terms of dropping. And um, of course, Australia is the home of the weekend and things like that. And, and labor rights were early here. But now it's under 2,000 hours a year. Okay, So few hours of work changes how people live their lives and engage. Work trips tend to be the longest of the trips that people make on a regular basis. So other things that have happened. So if we look at the labor force participation rate, which is rated, which is very much related to demographics, it peaked in the late 1990s. It started dropping around a little bit before 2003, the peak year for travel. Um, it was 67% of people who were in their peak, um, who were in their standard working years. And by 2013, it had fallen to 62%. You have 5% fewer people in the workforce, or really 10% of your labor force has been reduced. Uh, that's a significant change. And this is pre prior to COVID. If you look at the bottom of that graph, those are your COVID numbers, and they're down to about 61% of people who are of working age who are actually in the workforce. Um, we can look at the rise of at-home working. Okay, now, this has been rising very slowly for a very long time. This is some UK data until 2020 when it started to spike up enormously. Um, it might not stay at quite that level when we get to sort of a post COVID timeframe when COVID is normalized, but it's gonna be higher than it was beforehand. Um, we can look at trends in online shopping. This is data from Minnesota and the amount of minutes that people spent shopping per day outside of the home drop from, for this is for female non-workers, so which is the group that spent the most time shopping, from about 40 minutes 
gets to about 30 minutes over a course of 20 years. Male non-workers, a small group, has also sort of stayed flat. Um, female workers has dropped from 15 minutes to about 10 minutes, and male workers have dropped from about eight minutes to about seven minutes. Fewer people are going out to shop. Whereas that ha what's happening is that they're in going to engage in online shopping. So it's a substitution effect, right? People certainly aren't consuming fewer goods, but they're consuming them in a different way. And if you don't go out shopping and shopping comes to you, that leads to less travel. Um, we can look at, well, what else are you doing? Well, instead of going out to travel, you are doing other things. And one of the things that you were doing, at least prior to COVID, was eating out more. And so we can look at trends in eating out from the late 1860s through the present day. And we can see that the amount of money that was spent on food at home has dropped, in part because we've gotten a lot more efficient at producing food. But the amount of money that we spent on food away from home has increased significantly because we're much more likely to eat in restaurants. And alcohol has um, stayed roughly flat. And you can see things like prohibition show up in the statistics in the uh, period from 1918 to the early 1930s. We can look at how much travel that people are doing per household. And again, we can see that household travel has dropped. And this is data up through 2017, has dropped significantly from where it was in 2001 many fewer kilometers are traveled. So what are people, uh, for, for all of the normal activities, so what are people doing less of? One of the things people are doing less of is just being independent. Children are not being independent the way they were. So this is a graphic that's circulated. I don't know the original source of it, but it's appeared in uh, newspapers. Um, two generations ago, or three generations ago, Children were independent. They didn't need to be escorted on their travel for, by their parents. And they could travel very large territories. So you see the large area here, George, when he was aged eight in 1919, could walk six miles by himself in what was probably a rural landscape at the time. His son, Jack, when he was eight in 1950, could walk about a mile on his own to the woods. Um, the mother, um, Vicky, when she was eight in 1979, could walk to the swimming pool about a half a mile away. And the son is now is only allowed to walk on the, to the own end of his street, which is about 300 yards, 300 meters away. Okay, I, I believe this to be true, having seen people's reactions today to unescorted children. Um, this is data from the UK, and it's anecdotal, obviously, but it, it fits my perception of the um, if you have young children who are aged eight not being allowed to be um, in parks or go to school by themselves in many places and the number of students who are escorted to primary school by their parents rather than traveling on their own has increased enormously over the last 50 years so some of it is fuel prices so what's happened to fuel prices they go up and they go down they tend to go up before what we think of as economic recessions um, so you see spikes at various points in time. Um, a particular spike occurred in the early 2000s. So you might want to attribute the rise in fuel prices from, let's say, a dollar a gallon in 1998 to up to $4 a gallon by 2008, just before the global financial crisis. And that certainly has something to do with it, because if the cost of travel is higher, people will travel less. That's not surprising. But the price of fuel has fallen and the travel hasn't really picked up the same way. And if you think about this in real terms, the price of travel has fallen pretty close to where it was and the amount of travel hasn't come back with it. Um, there's substitution effects between modes. So fewer people are driving in the summer months. This is data from Minneapolis and more are walking and biking. Um, in the winter months, it's not quite the same because walking and biking in Minnesota aren't especially pleasant. So you see some people are doing other things in lieu of driving, and that explains some of it. But I think we need to be thinking about um, this is not necessarily just a temporary blip in the long-term rise of additional auto travel. And we can look at you know, an, another technology which was growing and growing. It was growing through the early 2000s, which is mail. And this is billions of pieces of mail handled by the post office in the United States. It arose through the 1990s with the advent of email. And to the early 2000s, it started to level off. And by 2005, 
it started to fall off a cliff. Okay, well, what happens if travel falls off a cliff? That's something we need to think about, okay, as we're planning transport systems. So there's a number of changes which will have varying kinds of effects. Now, electrification is one of the major, um, we might think of as revolutions in transport. And this is coming quickly. Um, it has less effect on travel behavior than the other potential revolutions that, that we'll talk about, but it's coming first and we need to think about how it interacts with some of these other changes. Um, electrification is coming because one, the cost of energy is dropping. Now, this isn't sort of the standard line as people always complain about the bills, but the price of solar has fallen steadily and consistently and this is data from August 2012 through February 2021, um, Australian prices from the Solar Choice Price Index. Okay, solar is inexpensive to install. Batteries have gotten more and more efficient. For lithium ion batteries, um, there are many different types of battery technologies that are possible. This is what's widely used today in electric vehicles. But people are working on um, other technologies um, which take up a lot less space and have a lot less weight associated with them, such as solid state batteries. So as new technologies get rolled out, if they're better than the existing technologies, they'll replace the existing technologies, which mean the cost of electric vehicles will continue to fall because the cost of their, their, major, their major cost component, the battery will continue to fall. Bloomberg NEF, um, a forecaster was looking at the crossover point between the internal combustion engine and the electric vehicle. In 2017, they projected that it would be in 2026. 2018, they projected it would be in 2024. And um, in 2019, they projected it be in 2022. Now we're in 2021 and we're about at that crossover point. Okay, so cost of, of car batteries is becoming a smaller and smaller element of the cost of the electric vehicle as a whole. So electric vehicles will shortly be less expensive to own and operate over the life cycle than internal combustion engine vehicles. And soon thereafter be less expensive to buy on initial purchase because they're much less complicated as vehicles, okay? Aside from the battery, which is expensive, um, the internal mechanical parts of it are less complicated. So, this is showing up in electric vehicle sales. Um, Norway, which is probably the leader in this and has public policy that aims to push people towards electric vehicles and has lots of hydropower, which makes electricity relatively cheap. In addition to being a major fuel exporter, which makes them very wealthy, has seen an uptick in electric vehicle new car market share. So it's now almost 80% of all new vehicles in Norway are electric vehicles. Um, the US, which is not nearly at that level, has seen growth in electric vehicle sales. And we can see that in 2020, battery EVs were about a little over 300,000 in sales. The first half of 2021 has almost matched that level. So it's almost gonna double just over the course of the last year in terms of new vehicle sales. Um, globally, past 5 million EVs sold in 2019. Um, in terms of monthly sales, it's been roughly 150% um, increase over the previous year. So one of the concerns is charging infrastructure. And of course, if the batteries are better, charging infrastructure becomes less critical, but charging infrastructure is becoming widely deployed. Um, and this is important for longer distance or intercity trips. For, and Australia is building a supercharger network as well. Um, Tesla is, of course, one of the major manufacturers, but not the only one. And long-term, we can be looking at things like dynamic wireless power transfer. The second of the three revolutions with, ele with electrification is automation. Um, and you often hear discussion of different levels of automation. And sort of the one that we're looking for is level four. Level five is not the critical one. Level four is the critical one. And the, 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 the deal with level four is that drivers don't have to pay attention. So you can have cars going around and the driver doesn't have to have a steering wheel. So the system is doing steering and acceleration and deceleration. It's monitoring the driving environment. If something bad happens, the system takes over, not the driver. So this isn't what um, 
Tesla is offering right now. This is what Waymo and some other companies are testing widely right now in, in various parts of the world, especially in parts of the United States. And level difference between level four and level five is where the system operates. So it operates on a geofenced area, but how big is the geofence? And that's gonna change over time, but you can imagine starts with the freeway system, the motorway system, and then extends over to selected local roads and then many local roads, but not necessarily everywhere. But of course, humans can't drive everywhere either. So that's something that you know, needs to be considered. So the advantages, the claimed advantages certainly of, of automated vehicles are safety. Um, human reaction times are pretty slow. In traffic engineering, we typically assume and design for a human reaction time of about two and a half seconds when someone sees that they need to slam on the brakes and when they actually slam on the brakes. Most people are better than that, but we have to design with some safety in mind. Automated vehicles will be on the order of a tenth of a second of reaction time. We'll see changes in vehicle form. We'll see changes in how people park cars. Um, cars will be able to drive more closely together and will be more orderly. So we should incre see increases in highway capacity. We'll see driverless vehicles. Um, we'll see passengerless vehicles. We'll see mobility for people who can't travel by themselves now. We should see lower costs of travel because in terms of things like um, taxis, we'll have taxis that don't require drivers. We'll have vehicles that um, can be used more efficiently, especially if they're shared. We'll have lots of excess capacity, so we'll be able to do other things with our transport rights of way, reallocate road space. We could see people who are living in their vehicles all the time, like in recreational vehicles, but they're not just moving eight hours a day when someone's driving them, they're moving 24 hours a day because no person has to drive them see changes in ownership models for vehicles. We'll see changes in activity and motion, what people can do while they're in their car. We'll see changes in status. So because these vehicles will look different, um, people will know who has an AV and who doesn't. It'll be a marker that you're progressive and a, and a technophile and so on. Um, and just as different kinds of high-end cars have have different kinds of status associated with them. People who have the new AVs will for many years have a, you know, at least think of themselves as being of a different status than the people who can't afford the car that they're driving. So again, a lot of that's the psych psychology. So how fast is this growing? So this is a log scale on the, on the y-axis. Cumulative kilometers traveled in autonomous mode by Google Waymo vehicles over the years, and this is from reports that they have published. They haven't put out a graph and they've only released limited points to the public versus, um, and that's the blue bars and the line that's above them. Um, and that's been growing steadily and relatively, um, you know, exponentially because it's a straight line on a log scale, um, on a logarithmic scale. And the, the Tesla uh, autopilot vehicles, and they've been growing steadily since 2016 through the present. And we can sort of extrapolate at a much higher level because all Teslas can have autopilot, but that's really only level two, whereas the Waymo vehicles are level four, which means that the driver is not taking over. And so the question of how much is the driver not taking over? So you can look at what's called the disengagement rate. So how many times is the vehicle disengaged per thousand kilometers? So if the vehicle were disengaged every kilometer, then the disengagement rate per thousand kilometers would be a thousand. And if it was disengaged once every thousand kilometers, then it would be um, a disengagement rate of one, but it's less than once every 10,000 kilometers as of 2016. And now we're not quite at once every 100,000 kilometers yet, but we're moving in that direction. So the question is, what is a, a disengagement rate when the human takes over the test vehicle? what is the rate at which it's ready for public consumption? Is it the, the human has to take over once a year, once every 10 years, once every 100 years, once every 1,000 years? Never. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that Waymo hasn't been widely deployed yet, okay? But as obviously, it's getting deployed more and more every year. So that's something we need to think about. 
Um, Tesla's got similar statistics um, claiming that a Tesla with the autopilot engaged only has one crash for every 4 million, um, I believe that's miles, um, when they have active safety features but not the autopilot, it's one crash every 2 million miles with neither autopilot nor active safety feeder features once every 978,000 miles because Tesla drivers are such superior drivers. Um, and the US average is about once every 484,000 miles. Um, now, these are statistics from Tesla. So you have to take them with a little bit of grain of salt. It's sort of hard to ascertain exactly what's going on. Did the driver disengage the autopilot before the crash and therefore the autopilot wasn't engaged at the time of the crash? These are things you need to think about as statistics get published, but it's looking like even these types of driver assist systems are significantly better than non-driver assist systems. And again, the driver is supposed to be monitoring. And in the case of a Tesla, they have to touch the steering wheel every minute or the car stops um, operating. Now, Uber was trying to play in this game too. Um, and they have the ignominy of resulting in the first human fatality from a driverless vehicle. When in 2018, in um, outside of Phoenix, Arizona, they killed Elaine Hertzberg, who was moving groceries on her bicycle across the street at night. Um, Uber got out of the business and in 2020 sold their AV arm to Aurora, which is looking at the trucking sector even more than the auto sector as a place to deploy these. And the advantage of the trucking sector is it's primarily in sort of on the, on the freeway system of the US, long distance hauls going from a warehouse to another warehouse or a factory to a warehouse, and you don't have to engage with local streets that much. And so that's another potential deployment path. Now, Toyota was running these vehicles, what they called an AV fleet, um, showing off at the recent uh, Tokyo Olympics and the Paralympics. Now, sadly, their AV hit a Paralympian who couldn't see, and uh, Toyota said AVs aren't ready, which is unfair for a couple of reasons. The first of is they weren't AVs. You can see very clearly in these photographs, a human monitoring the AV that went and hit somebody, and clearly the human didn't take over. The humans who were monitoring the system, and, and there's also a remote control monitor, had assumed that the AV would stop and didn't intervene when the AV didn't stop. And they assumed that the pedestrian would have stopped. And of course the pedestrian was a Paralympian and blind, so wasn't going to see the, the electric autonomous vehicle coming for them. So Toyota says, well, AVs aren't ready. Well, I think the, the real response should be that Toyota AVs aren't ready, but it doesn't mean that all AVs aren't ready. And they're blaming they're trying to generalize because they're not, they're not as advanced in AVs as others. So you, distinguishing the, the signal from the noise is really important. My own sense is that, that level four AVs will get deployed um, slowly and then quickly as all of these things are, and the curves will look like this. And the question of course is what years these things happen. If I had to guess, I'd say you'd start to be able to buy them in 2025 they'd be required on new vehicles by 2030 and they'd be pretty standard by 2040. And at some point we'll phase out human drivers from most roads because there'll be a hazard just as we eliminated horses from most roads hundred years ago, you know, probably 90 years ago. So the question of hands off, eyes on these, these level two and a half or even level three limited self-driving um, Tesla has been promising full self-driving mode. Um, they've been promising it for five years, any day now. Um, they're saying in a couple of weeks, but you know, they've been promising for a long time. So we'll be getting to that point. The question of, are we going to get there through sort of the Waymo type of vehicle with Waymo technologies where you have LiDAR on the roof and you have, um, a lot of algorithms along with some machine learning or whether you do it with a camera-based system the way Tesla does, which is much more dependent on machine learning, it isn't clear right now. Um, but at some point, human-driven vehicles will be prohibited. So when we're in our AVs, what will we be doing? Okay, so we can look at what do people do on trains. We can look at what do people do on cars right now. Um, when they're in cars, they already spend time eating and drinking, um, smoking and taking drugs. 
um, participating in religious practices, yelling at their children and so on, grooming. We can expect that people will do the same kind of thing. The heads up display, and the reason that a lot of the big tech companies are interested in this is if we've got somebody in a vehicle for about an hour a day and they're not driving and they're looking forward, the windshield is a display. And the windshield is a display where you can, if you're Google, show them YouTube videos and sell them advertising. If you're Apple, you get them to subscribe so that they can pay for um, videos or other kinds of services. So these types of activities are less um, unpleasant than driving. Obviously, you probably still prefer to watch a movie at home on a large screen TV than in your car while moving down the street, reading a book while you're moving and potentially while you're accelerating and decelerating is often upsetting to people. So how they do that, I mean, reading on a bus isn't as good as reading on a train. A self-driving car is probably more like a bus than like a train in that regard. But who knows, you have your own space, maybe you people will adjust to that. So if you're willing to do other things while you're in the car, all of the travel behavior theory says that you'll travel more because the cost of travel, the, the onerousness of travel has declined. So you often hear about connected and autonomous vehicles. I think this is a mistake. Um, it's a sort of a category error that people are making because connected vehicles are very different than autonomous vehicles. Connected vehicles talk to each other. Um, but the question is, can you rely on what people say to you without verifying it yourself? And if you're verifying it yourself, you're really an autonomous vehicle, not a connected vehicle. Now, there's lots of connectivity that already happened. Since the 1990s, General Motors vehicles have had OnStar. So if your car is in a crash, it calls home with a cell phone type of connection. We've been paying for tolls electronically for years, for decades now. Um, cars have in-vehicle internet. You have Wi-Fi's in some vehicles. People have traffic, um, traffic mapping, and of course, with real-time traffic information in their vehicles. Um, one of the questions is how much information from the vehicle is being transmitted back. So the traffic speed information has been, been transmitted back, and that, that comes through your in-vehicle satellite navigation systems, as well as through your Android and, and iPhone devices. You see a pitch, well, okay, you've got real-time road condition. For instance, if there's an ice patch and that information can be transmitted back, which I guess is good, but you know, hopefully you can detect the ice patch other ways. Then there's the question of infrastructure signs, signals, and markings. Are we gonna, if, if all vehicles have sensors, then we don't need to have traffic lights. We can have invisible traffic lights. We can have invisible street signs. But we're not at the stage, of course, anytime soon where all vehicles are like this. And then the question becomes, can somebody spoof a traffic signal? So you've got a vehicle, your, your vehicle looks at a traffic light and it says it's red, but it gets a radio signal from the traffic light which says it's green. Okay, those are various different, various types of things. Um, will we be able to, you'll be able to know what the traffic signals are going to be so you can accelerate or decelerate to match the traffic signal, but will the traffic signal try to time itself to match you? We already do this with public transit and emergency vehicles, but we don't do this for cars as a whole quite yet. Um, Teslas are, have been upgrading vehicle software just as Apple sends you an upgrade to your iPhone, which loads maybe overnight. Tesla's upgraded the operating system of its vehicles. Um, they did this before a hurricane a few years ago and gave everyone who hadn't paid for the extra battery in their car um, access to this. So what was sort of interesting is they would sell you a certain amount of battery capacity. You paid more, you get more battery capacity, but the cars were the same. It was just a software control on how much battery you had. Um, but then you get to the real, the good stuff of connectivity, real-time platoons, so the cars coordinate with each other to drive in platoons up and down the street closer together, leaving larger gaps. And the advantage of larger gaps is good for both cross traffic, but also pedestrians making it easier for pedestrians to cross the street. But can you trust the signals that are being sent from other cars that those signals won't be hacked and so on. And then negotiated control, two vehicles are approaching an intersection. One of them decelerates, one of them accelerates, neither of them has to stop. Again, are you gonna do that without verifying the change in behavior from the other vehicle? So, Connectivity is a very different type of technology. It's a much more complex technology. It only works between, you know, if you're going vehicle to vehicle, both vehicles have to have connectivity. They have to have consistent standards. 
Vehicle infrastructures may be a little bit simpler because the infrastructure doesn't move, but it's gonna be a long time before that's widely deployed. And then we have sharing. And we talk about mobility as a service and mobility as a service has a hundred different definitions. But broadly, let's think about the sharing economy. And we've seen this with shared bikes, um, which gained popularity about five, six years ago in China. Um, and that spread um, widely. There were attempts to deploy that in other places. Um, the, these are stationless shared bikes, so they're dockless. You can drop them anywhere. Um, Station-based shared bikes started even earlier, um, but obviously have a lot more restrictions on them. And so then the question goes, who manages these kinds of systems? And there were a glut of bicycles on the roads in China, and many of them have been taken off. Is this a fad or is this a trend? They've been tried multiple times at Sydney, and they've, they've never really stuck. Um, first with shared push bikes and then with shared e-bikes. Um, and then COVID hit, and that, of course, changed people's um, patterns. They were growing significantly through the early 2010s, um, but it's leveled off in the last few years. There's also shared cars. Um, we have car share systems here, but the main competitor to that is really uh, Uber and, um, and the like. And if you look at, again, we have a log scale on the y-axis here. Steady growth in Uber and its main US competitor Lyft in terms of rides per year over the early 2010s, um, dropping significantly last year for obvious reasons, picking up a little bit after lockdown, but not even restoring back to the previous year's levels yet. Okay, so ride share is probably taken most of the car sharing market. The car share is probably still useful for long distance trips, but not so much for the short distance trips because it's too expensive and too difficult. You have to go and go to the car share. You have to predict how long you're going to use it. You have to pay for it in, in advance as opposed to paying for just the trip. It's really underutilizing the resource. So, the dream is something like cloud commuting where no one has to own a car. You have a fleet of shared autonomous vehicles that are electric, of course, um, that are relatively inexpensive, in this case, lower than the cost of car ownership. So people who actually have to go to work can use these vehicles to go to work. The vehicle would pick them up at their home, take them to the workplace, and then go and pick up the next person and bring them to a workplace. Um, it's a smaller fleet. It's a more modern fleet, fewer vehicles on the road in total, but you have excess travel in terms of deadheading. So instead of parking at the destination, the vehicle's now back on the road without a passenger waiting to pick up the next passenger. Trying to optimize this is a challenge. Um, so there's lots of coverage issues and logistics issues. This works in high density areas. How well does it work in low density areas? How do people pay for this? How do we redesign streets to accommodate pickup and drop off? Still open questions. So vehicles have gotten larger. This is data from the Australian new vehicle market um, from 2000 to 2020 or so. Um, and we see that passenger car sales have dropped which sounds like a good thing until you realize that SUV sales and light truck sales have gone up, meaning that the average size of a vehicle on the road has gone up significantly. And this is a trend that's been seen in, in most countries um, to a greater or lesser extent. In the US, there are more SUVs sold than passenger cars these days, and Australia is moving in that direction as well. But we can see lots of new vehicle forms coming out. This is the Renault Twizy. Um, and, and this is an electric vehicle from the early 2010s, but the idea is it's a much smaller vehicle. Maybe they can change shapes and you can stack them. Um, this is a really interesting, it's basically an enclosed three-wheeled motorcycle type of device. Imagine this, electric. it's electric, could be automated. Toyota's manufactured a few of these, but they're not selling them widely. Um, I don't know if the market doesn't want them or the company isn't willing to sort of go um, in a big way on this. And this goes, this is modeled on an idea that's been around for a long time. General Motors had what was called the lean machine, lean because it's skinny and lean because it leaned. Um, and they had that in the late 1970s as a prototype. 
Gogoro is raising a lot of money um, and they're basically scooters, but the interesting, they're electric, they have swappable batteries and there'll be a lot of battery swapping stations. So you can take out the battery pretty easily, put in a new battery and off you go. And if you had cars that were half the width, of course you could double the capacity um, of a lane. And so this is the idea that's been out for a while. Of course, you might get cars that are a lot bigger. You have conference meetings inside of cars, or you might even have um, electric unicycles out there. So there's a lot of different directions for demassification of vehicles. The most obvious is the electric bike, and probably a lot more attention should be paid to that than, than has been. Um, bicycles have a lot of advantages, but um, in any case, they significantly improve the utilization of road space. Um, we have Lots of changes in the delivery market. We've seen these in the last few years. Um, delivery of um, not very tasty meals um, by Uber and so on. Delivery of groceries by the grocery markets. Um, how do we deal with last mile deliveries? Well, if you have a house, they can leave it in front of your house. But if you have an apartment, we might want a locker. Um, Amazon's testing being able to open the trunk of the boot of your car and leaving a package in the boot of your car. Um, they've been trying to get keys to your house. So if you are an Amazon customer, you can give Amazon access to your house. Um, what do we do about refrigerated goods? If you're out of the house, how do we leave refrigerated goods outside, particularly in the summer months? So there'll be changes to land use that depend upon the changes that we have to vehicle types. We could talk, think about shared autonomous electric vehicles. Um, this favors density because um, you'll have a critical mass for, you can just step out the front door of your apartment building, there'll be a car waiting for you. Um, in contrast, more suburban environments, private or personal autonomous electric vehicles make suburbanization easier because driving is easier and we're more willing to take longer distance trips. So what this does to travel demand is a bit ambiguous because it really depends on what market models come up and does it lead to more travel or less travel? We really can't say at this point. What we know is that we can probably do something with car storage, that is parking lots. We can probably do something with fuel stations. We can probably do something with roads that are overly wide and rededicate that space. So while we don't know What's going to happen? Theory can't answer the question of what's going to happen to the amount of AV travel compared with today. Um, it's really an empirical question. We need to understand what's going on sort of from, a, from an analytical perspective so that we can make good investment choices. So we've got bicycling um, and trying to reduce our road use and road space use as an issue. Um, the point is most roads are underused most of the time. Now we think about roads when they're being used because we're there to perceive them when they're crowded. But when you're not there, no one else is there either and the road is empty. So there's a lot of capacity outside of the peak. Even during the peak, most pavement is unused. There's a huge amount of space between vehicles when they're moving. Um, now that's for safety reasons, but that's for safety reasons with human drivers that's different than safety reasons with automated drivers. Um, in those vehicles, most seats are unoccupied most of the time. Um, most cars are a lot heavier than required to safely move passengers, and they've been getting heavier as we see. Roads are so wide that most of the time, most roads are used to store vehicles, okay? They, you know, you park your car out in front of your house, that's fine. Um, you put a bunch of boxes in front of your house, someone will take them away. And of course, we're wasting a lot of time at traffic lights um, that we don't need to. So there's a number of dimensions that we should be playing with. And as we look forward for forward to redesigning our road systems, playing with the ideas of vehicle width and lane width. Okay, lanes have to be wide enough for vehicles. We, vehicles are wide enough so they can fit in lanes. Um, vehicle weights have to be consistent with the pavements, but they're far too heavy right now. Vehicle occupancy, um, if we wanna have one person per vehicle, why do we have cars that seat five people or six people or eight people? And what can we do with traffic signals? So there's a lot of alternative vehicle designs that have been out for a century, motorcycles, bicycles, and so on that are available to us. And we can look at how much space is taken up by different modes of transport. So if you look at the, the figure on the left, 
comparing cars and then people. And then if we sort of make the people much more compact, we can get a lot more efficiency out of that same amount of road space. So pricing will change. And this is how do we get to the end of traffic from a policy perspective? So all congestion is unnecessary. We can use road pricing of various kinds to eliminate um, overuse of the roadway, to eliminate excess use of the roadway, basically congestion during the peak. Not all travel, we just wanna manage it just as we price all sorts of goods higher during the peak than the off peak. Not the least of which is public transport, which was more expensive during the peak than the off peak, but roads aren't. So first thing to note is that EVs don't pay a fuel tax and they still use roads. So they're sort of an obvious target. Um, second, autonomous vehicles can be driving around driverless. And so the penalty that people have now for excess use of the road is at least in part their own time. But when you have autonomous vehicles, that's gonna go away. But we still like to have a highway user-free principle so that people who are using roads are paying for the use of roads. And the answer is to vary vehicle mileage charges, um, vehicle distance charges for electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and anyone else who wants to opt in with the charge varying by location and time of day. And the good news is that several Australian states, including New South Wales, are going to be implementing road user charges on electric vehicles and presumably on autonomous vehicles as well, um, while eliminating stamp duty, that is the tax on electric vehicles. So we don't wanna discourage people from using electric vehicles. So you don't charge them a high fixed tax for buying them, but you don't want them to overconsume either. So you still need to charge a per use basis. Now, this is not the best news. It's still a distance-based charge rather than a time of day-based charge. But once you've got the technology in place, giving an off-peak discount is fairly straightforward. So the first implication is that if autonomous vehicles give us increased throughput per square meter of pavement um, and we have lower demand, then we have fewer square meters of pavement required. So we can get rid of a lot of the roads that we have out there. From an analysis perspective uh, for students, there's new professions that are gonna be opening up. And there's one I like to think of as traffic programming, which is basically developing algorithms for cooperative behavior among autonomous vehicles. So this is different than what traffic engineers do today, which is design infrastructure and time traffic signals and put signs and markings in various places. And it's different than transport planning which is figuring out where infrastructure should go and policy should be in place. And it's different than highway engineering, which is looking at geometric design. So it's about looking at algorithms. Now you might say, well, that's what software engineers should be doing. And that's what mechanical engineers designing these vehicles should be doing. Yes, but they're designing for the vehicle itself. They're not designing for society as a whole. They're saying, okay, we need to move our passenger safely through traffic as opposed to making the system operate well. And that's where traffic programming comes in as a field of study. Um, and really we're not thinking about how to optimize traffic from a decentralized perspective and we ought to be. So students who are interested should feel free to contact us. I'll say transport is interesting again. And if you agree, please feel, to feel, feel free to contact us in the transport group to discuss careers in transport, um, what classes to take or whether you wanna do postgraduate studies. And with that, I will stop. All right, thank you for that great presentation. It's already six o'clock, but I think we can fit in maybe five minutes of questions going a bit over time. Um, I'll screen share my, the Slido question. All right, um, I'm guessing you can see my screen. So the first question was, what are the challenges or key steps towards implementing an effective smart card system for a city's public transport, such as Australia's Opal card system? So um, New South Wales Opal card system was implemented a few years ago, uh, I guess sort of fully implemented really by roughly 2016. Um, Hong Kong had a system in 1998. There are many cities in the US that don't have a system like this yet. Um, the key challenges are political and institutional. And that's true of most things in the transport sector. The technology is far ahead of what institutions can handle. So if you have a single agency that's responsible for all of the public transport service, it's not that difficult compared to if you have multiple agencies involved and if you have private operators. 
In New South Wales, you've got separate operators for buses and for the trains. And so that was implemented first on the trains and then on buses. It's you know technically a little bit easier to implement on train on, at train stations than on moving buses. But that's not the real problem. I mean, the real problem is just getting everyone coordinated. Now, it's been a huge success and everywhere these kinds of smart card systems have been done. And it's one of the reasons that public transport ridership in New South Wales was rising significantly through the 2010s up until COVID. So um, soon we're moving forward. I mean, we're already sort of widely deploying credit card based systems. So Opal might disappear and everyone will just use standard F posts or, or credit cards to pay for public transport because you don't really need to have a separate currency system for transportation. There's no reason it can't use the same currency as everyone else. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, so the next question was, will transportation in urban areas ever shift from a car-centric approach to a non-car-centric approach to accommodate sustainability, or is this improbable? Um, some urban areas will. I mean, well, it sort of depends on how you define urban areas, right? So Paris is defining an area that's um, roughly the equivalent of Piermont, the Sydney CBD and Lomalu, that will be car free by 2030. Okay, so in the down, in the CBD areas, it's pretty straightforward. In shopping areas, it's pretty straightforward to do. It's still politically challenging. And the main political challenge, not outside of the CBD, but in shopping areas is merchants think a lot more shoppers come by automobile than actually do, and are very reluctant to give up parking spaces in front of their stores. And changing that mindset is difficult. Technically, it's pretty simple. You just put up a bollard and say, you can't drive here. Um, but politically, you have to convince people that they can walk a block or two blocks or that they can come by public transport or that your customers are walking or biking to your site anyway. And I think that's, that's a hard problem. Um, you have sort of a lot of institutional problems that Traffic engineering that makes a lot of sense in rural areas might not fit in urban contexts, but you have the same traffic engineers doing it. Hopefully newer, younger traffic engineers will have different ideas and um, paradigm shift as old people retire or die and new people come into the field. So I think the mindset has to change, but the mindset changes demographically. Yeah, um, so the next question is, in cities where safety is a significant concern for individuals, use of transport, what are some smart city solutions you consider implementing? So a lot of the smart city stuff is about information technology, computers and software. Um, nothing inherently wrong with that, although, you know, some privacy issues perhaps um, some issues about their effectiveness, but the solution for safety is fewer cars. Pedestrians bumping into pedestrians don't kill each other. Bicyclists bumping into pedestrians very rarely kill pedestrians. Cars hitting pedestrian rarely kills the driver or the passengers of the car, but the car hitting the pedestrian kills the pedestrian at unfortunately large numbers. So we wanna reduce the number of times that cars hit pedestrians. The easy solution for that would be having fewer, easy technical solution for that would be having fewer cars around. But speed limits is the obvious solution and enforced speed limits of 30 kilometers an hour. Because if you hit somebody, there's a, you know, if you hit someone at 30 kilometers an hour, they're much more likely to survive than if you hit them at 40 or 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. Which doesn't mean you should hit anyone with your vehicle, but it'd be better if you hit them at a slower speed. So the smart solution is fewer cars and slower cars. Um, you could look at if vehicles are autonomous, they certainly have better reaction time and they'll be less likely to hit people. And that's gonna be a safety type of, of thing. Um, the engineering strategies of trying to control where pedestrians go is really evil in a lot of ways because there's no reason that pedestrians should be channelized into narrow um, ways for the benefit of out of town motorists, which is really what's happened. You can only cross at crosswalks now. A hundred years ago, pedestrians could cross the street anywhere in a city. Um, they have to stop at traffic lights now. They're not stopping at traffic lights to allow the cross pedestrian flow to go, go by easily. They're stopping at traffic lights so the cars can go by easily. 
Now, this reduces the amount of space that pedestrians can cover in a given amount of time. Basically, you're slowing down pedestrians for the benefit of cars. Pedestrians can, can go about half as far, a third as far um, today as they could 100 years ago before traffic lights were widely deployed in cities because they're stopping every other intersection um, and waiting 30, 60, 90 seconds. Okay, this is, if you, if you really want people to be walking and make walk, you have to make walking good. And to make walking good, you have to make walking fast and not inconvenienced by cars, which means you need to prioritize pedestrians rather than cars. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I've never actually thought of it, about that from like a pedestrian's viewpoint. Um, I think that'll be the last question for today. Um, it would be great if everyone could turn their cameras on for a quick photo. Yep, some people still turning on their camera on the second screen. Just wait a few seconds. All right, um, thanks everyone. Um, special thanks to David Levinson for doing this amazing presentation and answering those questions. Um, if you wanna check out the next academic seminar, it's gonna be on the 12th of October with Kim Rasmussen. Um, also join us on next Friday for a study session and games night. Um, with that, the academic seminar is concluded.